Lily, you're such a good girl. You're such, and you look beautiful. She got a spa a day since she came back looking absolutely beautiful. Can you sit? Can you get down? Come on down. Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. <laughs> well, my sister's at it again. I called her just because I hadn't checked in for a while and she sounded a little congested. And I said, what's up, Janet? She said, well, I just have a cold. And, and you know, I mean, what, what have I been saying for weeks? That like there's a ton of virus out there and when you have a cold, you should check yourself. Of course, my sister didn't. So I said, check yourself right after the call and she did and guess what? My sister's positive. <laughs> of course she is. So I put her on Paxlovid and she's feeling much better today. Uh, she did have one question a lot of people asked, like she said, well, she had enough, a test for herself, but her husband, uh, who's at risk also, uh, she had an expired test and she said, oh, can I use it? And, you know, the expiration dates are kind of suggested expiration dates. If you do the test and the control band is positive, then that means the test worked. If the control band is negative, then it didn't work. And so that's the best way to use an expired test. But the expiration date is probably way before it really expires. Anyway, I hope you're feeling better, Janet. But of all the people to not test, I mean, really, you're killing me. Well, more news. You know, my favorite state, Florida. I can't, guess what? There's a measles outbreak. Well, why is there a measles outbreak? Well, they may have the most uninformed uh, public health official on earth. Uh, Dr. Jo I'm going to use doctor in quotes, Joseph uh, Ladapo. Uh, he is their, their public health uh, Florida Surgeon General, and he has been recommending not, you just don't get vaccinated. He's also been the one that's been saying mRNA vaccines are bad for you, which they're not. And so Florida is getting like really, really bad advice. And all of you know that measles is the most infectious aerosolized virus with an R number of 18, which means you have to have 95% of the population vaccinated or you're gonna get outbreaks. <laughs> well, they're down to 90% because their parents that actually listen to this guy. Anyway, it's really sad because these are all preventable diseases. <laughs> we're, we're, going back, we're going back to the 1850s. It's kind of sad to see that uh, people are getting bad advice. But if you have kids, get, get them vaccinated. Measles is extremely contagious. There are deaths internationally. There have been, I think, 26 cases reported already, and there was an outbreak in Fort Lauderdale. So, I mean, it's really not good. Anyway, uh, let's look at what's going on with uh, COVID, because as I said, as my sister knows now, there's a lot of virus around, and it, the good news is, Almost everybody has been infected. I showed you the data last week, but n over 90% of the population has either been infected or vaccinated or both. And so we have a lot of immunity to it. So, and the virus has evolved to be less virulent. In other words, it doesn't cause as much bad disease, but it causes a lot of colds and you're infecting everybody. So uh, the CDC recommendations are still isolation, but they're probably gonna change that. I recommend it to my sister to isolate for five days uh, and then uh, wear a mask. But we'll see. Anyway, the good news is hospitalizations continue to drop. This is a continuation. But if you look at wastewater activity nationally, it had a big peak back in, you know, a few months ago, but it's kind of plateaued and it's plateaued at a pretty high level. Uh, here in Houston, we, you know, we've been leading the way on, on wastewater analysis. We're still quite high at 400% higher than July of 2020, and it's, but it's been stable. So we've plateaued. Hopefully uh, that'll continue that way. And our friends at TEFI, the Texas, whatever it is, uh, epidemiologic uh, study thing that we have that's really uh, got 80% of the, of the population covered by wastewater analysis. It, sh it shows some really interesting data. Uh, so of course, SARS-CoV-2 is coming down it's still pretty high, as I've said, but so is uh, influenza A and B coming down now, respiratory syncytial virus A and B coming down. So, you know, we're sort of coming out of the winter respiratory virus season, and hopefully we'll have a wonderful spring. Of course, half of Texas is on fire, so there's always something. And then, of course, we have hurricane season. Oh, Lord. 
Uh, fascinating, JN1 is not only dominant, it is the virus. 97% of all viruses are JN1. Uh, very, very interesting uh, in terms of viral evolution. So a couple of really fascinating studies. So, you know, we've talked about, uh, remember the evolution, the appearance of Omicron, which was like 25 or 26 mutations in the spike protein, and then BA2.86, we talked about that. It was in Europe with over 30 mutations. And we, you know, and I speculated, as many people did, that it was in an, an immune-compromised individual because uh, if a virus is replicating in an individual and you're not clearing the virus, it has the opportunity to develop all these mutations. And then when it finally jumps to another person, you get this dramatic change and shift. And we saw that in Omicron. We saw that in BA2.86. So there's a really interesting study in Nature that basically was saying, let's look at, at community surveillance. Is it happening in many people? So they actually looked at, they, they were able to identify 381 individuals that had a high titer of virus that persisted for over 30 days. So that's really, just to acknowledge, that's something we did not expect. We expected that this would be in just an immune com compromised host. But here's 380 people did, and 54 had viral RNA that persisted for over 60 days. So that means there, it's not often, but in rare individuals, they have a persistent viral replication and an ind individual that's not clearing the virus, that's where you can accumulate all these mutations and that's how Omicron can show up or the JN1 mutation. Uh, and, and the other thing that they found in this study from the UK was that individuals that had persistent virus uh, replication had a 50% higher chance of having long, long COVID. So they said this isn't common, one in 500 or one in 1,000 infections can become persistent uh, and that they have these persistent viral loads for 30 to 60 days. And in those individuals, they noticed more than one amino acid substitution. In other words, many substitutions developing. So this is, a, it, was a, it was in Nature, a very prominent uh, scientific journal. But this is really important because this is saying you don't necessarily be immune compromised. There are individuals who were able to, or who are unable to clear a virus rare, but in those individuals, as long as there's viral replicating, these are the kinds of people who will be able to generate these big changes in the virus. So again, all the more reason why we need to be concerned about what goes on in the rest of the world. This is another really interesting study that came from the Journal of Immunology. And this was looking at the phases of antibody responses to either infection or infection plus vaccination. And what they showed was very interesting. And this is sort of, again, this is sort of an interesting new, new studies that we sort of, I think, intuitively thought was right, or at least we inferred from the data, but we didn't really see uh, clear data for it. So this shows, uh, this is from, uh, the, called the Paris study, this is from Paris. Uh, they looked at individuals, and if you look, the yellow dots are people who have been infected and vaccinated. The blue dots are people who've just been vaccinated only. And what you can see is that the combination of being vaccinated and being infected produced a longer, a, a much higher titer of antibodies. You know, so in some sense, and I, we've talked about this when people ask me, well, I've been vaccinated and then I got infected, should I get another booster? This basically shows what I was suggesting to people is when you get infected after you've been vaccinated or, or the combination of the two, it acts like a booster. And that's exactly what the data shows. And then later you can see in this case, vaccination, a second vaccination with a booster brings the, those people who have had a lower immune response up to those with hybrid, vac uh, hybrid responses. The other interesting thing that this, this shows is there are two phases of the antibody response. The first is there's sort of a fairly rapid decline, but then there's a persistence of antibodies for about six or seven months. Again, these are studies that now kind of explain what we've observed, which was you, you know, you, you got vaccinated or infected and you stayed pretty much uh, resistant for six or seven or eight months. And that's been sort of the cycle of when we've recommended boosters. Uh, anyway, that was a very interesting study in the Journal of Immunology. One other question that came up around boosters was, uh, are there more side effects? So, you know, people are going, I don't want to get this new XBB vaccine because they haven't tested it. Well, they've now looked. Uh, there's been over a million adults have been bo boosted with the latest vaccine, and what it showed was when they look at all the adverse effects, there have been 28 adverse effects, the side effects of being uh, getting a vaccine or getting infected, and there was no increase with this new booster. So it basically just says that 
the booster is is safe, you know, is safe and, and good to use. And then one final thing, I know it's hard to believe, but the WHO has come out for the next flu season recommendations. And uh, I mean, oh, this is how it works. There's a panel of people who sit around, they look at what's circulating worldwide in the avian population, mostly in, in Asia, and then also what's going on in the southern hemisphere and, and to try to predict what's going to happen next winter. And so what they plan on doing is basically what's circulating is still what's, what, what was around this year, H1N1, H3N2. Interestingly enough, the Yamagata strain, we've talked about that, kind of disappeared during the masking period of uh, SARS-CoV-2. And so it's just with the Victoria strain. So there's no Yamagata next year uh, vac in the vaccine. In the, so it'll be a trivalent vaccine. So I want to end it, uh, today <clears throat> with shout outs. First of all, congratulations to Dr. Taylor Ripley, Associate Professor of Thoracic Surgery, who received the Michael F. Price Memorial Grant Award for Esophageal Cancer Research. Uh, this comes from the Gregorio Family Foundation, uh, and it supports esophageal cancer. So that's terrific for them. Dr. Ripley, along with Dr. Uh, uh, Wan Shu, will continue their research on esophageal adenocarcinoma. Shout out to Jeffrey Jones, professor of urology, who was elected president of the Society of Governmental Service Urologists at the annual uh, SGSU Kimbro Urologic Seminar. Uh, he's been a member of the society for 25 years most of us recently serving as the VA member at large for that society. And then finally today is National Employee Appreciation Day. I want to thank everybody who's an employee of Baylor College of Medicine. Does that include me? I'm not, I guess, I'm going to thank myself. <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm an employee, but I want to thank all the employees of Baylor College of Medicine. It's a great organization. I love being here. It's an outstanding place with fabulous individuals, and that's why we are a wonderful organization. Anyway, uh, have a great weekend. Have fun at the rodeo, and I can't wait to see you next week. <laughs>